class. This is the last part of the lecture for chapter one, part three. So in this part of the lecture, we will just talk about four financial statements and a ratio called return on assets. In the previous two parts of the videos, we covered um, all this information already. So I want to remind you about the accounting equation, right? So we said that accounting equation is assets equals to liabilities plus stockholders equity. And then we expanded this uh, equation and said that we are taking out of equity three subgroups of accounts. So we're going to say also plus revenue. Oops, let me do plus here. And you know, your textbook says first dividends. It doesn't really matter. I like to think of, the, uh, of this as plus revenue minus expenses minus dividends because it's then easy to remember as R E D red. Okay. So this is this is it. This is our expanded uh, version of the accounting equation. Now at the end of the period, which could be a month or a quarter or a year, we ran all our transactions, we analyzed them. So we will have final balances for each account and then we can group them together. And so we will prepare summaries of uh, financial information known as financial statements. This is the single most important thing you will learn in this class, how to prepare and also read and interpret financial statements. Uh, financial statements go uh, outside of the company. They are filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission. So everybody has access to the financial statements, as, we men as I mentioned before. I showed you an example of Google. You know, we have access to their financial statements. So they have to follow gap rules. The way they are prepared has to be more uniform. Now, I do want to mention that each account, I should say each group of accounts, only has one home, right? Um, in this class, we become familiar with three financial statements. This sequence in which we prepare financial statements is very important. Income statement will be prepared, for, prepared first. And so income statement is pretty much, uh, it's a, uh, it shows the results of operations. And guys, the formula is revenues minus expenses equals to net income or net loss. So out of all this, let me make it, you know, some color here. So let me make it blue. Out of all these accounts, only revenues and expenses, I will make them blue, they are listed on the income statement, nothing else. We will not find cash here because it's an asset. We will not find dividends here because it's not an expense. We will not find accounts payable. We will only find revenues and expenses equals to net income or net loss. First statement to prepare. The second statement we have to prepare, and let me make it... Um, uh, I don't know, let me make it green, dark green, is called uh, the statement, statement of retained earnings. And guys, it shows changes in the retained earnings account. Uh, and the retained earnings account is this large account, which is part of stockholders' equity, and it includes uh, my... Uh, revenues and expenses, which we already subtracted, and also dividends. So the formula here will be uh, as follows. We're going to take beginning balance of retained earnings. So unless the company is brand new, it will always have some beginning balance. I want to remind you that retained earnings is the company's lifelong net income less lifelong loss, less lifelong dividends. I actually showed you in the first part of the video a great example of how retained earnings work for Amazon. So we're going to take beginning balance, which will be zero only for the brand new company. And the beginning balance often could be negative too. And we're going to add net income from right here, right? So this net income and net loss, the reason we had to prepare it first, the income statement, is that I cannot uh, prepare the statement of um, retained earnings 
until I know net income and net loss. So I take net income right here, or, you know, I'll say here, or if it's, or I subtract net loss, right? And then, guys, we're going to subtract dividends. Dividends. And we're going to have my ending retain earnings. Ending retain earnings. So, guys, from the account point of view, dividends I will put in green. And, guys, part of equity. So, right in here, I will say there is common stock and there is equity. I'm sorry, and there is retained earnings. So retained earnings also is listed on the statement of retained earnings. Okay. And then the third financial statement we're going to prepare, let me make it some different color here, is going to be the most important statement, the one that finishes everything, puts everything together, and it's called the balance sheet. And the balance sheet is, um, it's a company's financial position at a point in time. I did not mention that, guys, every financial statement, income statement, statement of written earnings, statement of cash flows we're going to talk about later, they are prepared for a period of time, not for one day. The only one that is prepared for one date is the balance sheet. So the formula is very simple. The formula here is just you know, assets equals to liabilities plus stockholders equity. And I want to remind you that stockholders equity is common stock and retained earnings. So we take this ending retained earnings, I'll make it bold, and we transfer it right here. So that's why we have to prepare income statement and the statement of retained earnings first. So then we can prepare the balance sheet and we prove we total up assets and then we add together liabilities and equity accounts that my total assets must be equal to total liabilities and stockholders' equity. So assets, liabilities, and equity accounts, they are called balance sheet accounts. So guys, I want to mention here that retained earnings is actually the only account that has two homes. It's the only account that will be listed in the statement of retained earnings and also on the balance sheet. Every other account has just one home. And then, guys, the last statement is the statement of cash flows. Um, cash is so important for a business. It's a lifeblood of business. Uh, that It's the only account that actually deserves its own um its own statement. And guys, the statement of cash flows, we have a, a whole chapter, chapter 12, 12 de uh, devoted to it. And guys, at Chabot, we cover uh, chapter 12 actually in business 1B. We move it and cover it in managerial accounting just because this course has so much information. So you will see the statement of cash flows here in chapter 1. You, you need to know what it is. You will prepare it in your homework and then you will not see it for the rest of the class. You will only uh, revisit it at the end of business 1B. And so this statement shows uh, inflows and outflows of cash. It just focuses on cash. And I will talk about it later. So you've got, uh, uh, you've got your financial statements. So in the slides, guys, we have, first of all, I have a slide here that talks about the format. And, you know, when you do your work in Connect, Connect is very good about, you know, formatting it for you. But because financial statements are filed with the government and everybody uses them, then we have to follow certain format right here. Uh, guys, as I said, there are four financial statements and this is the sequence in which they are prepared. I already went over it. And these are examples from your textbook. So income statement, look, it's prepared for a period of time. If you say just December 31st, it's a mistake. I don't make net income uh, in one day. It's, it would say four months or it could say four year, four quarter, for uh, six months and the December 31st, right? So it's from December 1st to the 31st. So you list revenues minus expenses. So you've got total revenues. This business has two revenue accounts. It has two expense accounts. Revenues minus expenses equals to net income. We double underline 
the grand total. The double underline means stop. This is the final amount. Nothing will be added or subtracted from it. One line means above amounts above me. One underline means amounts above me will be added or subtracted. And guys, the dollar signs, you put the dollar sign only with the first amount in each column and with the grand total. Now, if your revenues are lower than your expenses, you would have net loss, right? And guys, net income, sometimes we call it profit. Sometimes, I'm sure you've heard about it, it's called the bottom line because it's on the bottom of the financial statement. And then we take net income and move it to the next financial statement. It's the statement of retained earnings. Again, the beginning balance here is zero because it's a brand new business. Plus net income minus dividends gives you ending retained earnings. And then the balance sheet, we have all your assets totaled up $40,400. Then you have one liability, two equity accounts. And notice retain earnings we transfer from the previous statement. And together your liabilities and equity are also $40,400. So the balance sheet has two grand totals. Okay, uh, let me go, before I go into the statement of cash flow, let me go back to the spreadsheet, which we did in part two. I gave you a bunch of accounts and we classified them. Now we have to determine, well, what is the financial statement? Where are they going to be reported, right? Common stock is an equity account and it will be on the balance sheet. Any kind of expenses and re revenues will be on the income statement. So when I see expenses or revenues, that's, oops, that's income statement. Revenue, expense, expense, revenue. Uh, so, any kind of asset or liability is the BS. In accounting, we like our BS. The BS is the balance sheet and it's the most important financial statement. So, any liability uh, and assets and two equity accounts, which are common stock and retain earnings, they're reported on the balance sheet. Dividends is the only account unique to the statement of retain earnings. Uh, liability is balance sheet, assets is the balance sheet, asset is the balance sheet, um, assets are on the balance sheet. Retained earnings is the only account that has two homes. So it's listed on the statement of retained earnings and also transferred to the balance sheet. So that pretty much completes, completes this table. Okay, so, so the statement of cash flows. Uh, this is the last statement. Uh, like I said, I am asking you to prepare it in your homework, but I will not ask you to prepare it on the test. You only will have multiple choice questions about it. It just focuses on cash. Only cash inflows when cash goes up or cash outflows. What you do need to know, you need to know that we take all our cash activities and we classify them in three different categories. The first one are operating activities. The second one is investing activities. And the third one is financing activities. So let me first of all define investing activities. It, it has nothing to do with stock or dividends. It's us paying for buying or selling long-term assets with cash. So when you buy a piece of equipment, it's considered to be an investment. You are spending, only if you buy it for cash, with cash. Uh, so you're spending cash, but it's actually considered to be a good investment in our future because we're gonna use equipment for five, seven, 10 years. So whenever you buy or sell long-term assets such as equipment, machinery, trucks, airplanes, um, intangibles, you know, uh, different brand names, you can acquire um, land, right? This is considered to be a, an investing activity. If it's been paid in cash or when you get rid of it, you sell it, you get cash back. Uh, financing activities is has anything to do with stockholders' equity or with long-term um, loans. 
anything to do with stockholders' equity or long-term loans. So if you get a five-year car loan or a mortgage, you get cash in. Um, when you pay cash dividends, cash goes out. When you get a cash investment in return to, to common stock, that's cash coming in. And then everything else is operating. This is day-to-day -day activities. This is, um, you know, collecting cash from credit customers. This is paying cash for supplies or for rent expense, for telephone expense. It's uh, uh, making sales and collecting cash right away. So any kind of day-to-day -day operating activities um, are listed first. And so, guys, we total up each subgroup. So usually we want to have a lot of cash provided by operations so we can use it to invest in our future. Here you can see that we you know, did not make much cash from operations, so we actually had to finance the purchase of equipment by getting cash from our stockholders. So you have to know how to classify. Let me go to exercise 1-19 uh, and let's take a look at the classification of cash activities. So here you go. This is exercise 1-19 and it's on page 37. So match each description with its section from the statement of cash flows. And the section by the section they mean operating, investing, or financing. Cash purchase of equipment is an investing activity, right? Long-term asset. Cash paid for, paid for dividends is an example of financing activity because it has to do with equity. Cash for, paid for advertising is just a day-to-day -day operating activity. Any kind of expense, right, will go into operating activities. Cash paid for wages, again, that's an expense, operating activity. Cash paid on accounts payable to supplier, operating day-to-day -day activity. Cash received from clients, that's an operating activity. Cash paid for rent, yes, still an operating activity. And cash investment from shareholders, that's an example of a financing activity. Okay, so that concludes financial statements. I do want to show you this excellent problem. I think it's a part of your homework, so I want to, I want to get you started. And it's a problem 1-1a on page 42. And in this problem, you have uh, different transactions, and then you are asked to see if the transaction impact, if it impacts the balance sheet, the income statement, and or the statement of cash flows. And within the balance sheet, does it impact assets, liabilities, or equity? And within the cash flows, does it impact? Is it an operating, investing, or financing activity? So let me do a couple of these for you. Uh, owner invests $900 cash in business in exchange for stock. Cash goes up. That's an asset. And right away, if cash is impacted, it goes to the statement of cash flows. So this is an example of a financing activity because it has to do with equity. And guys, in exchange for common stock, equity goes up common stock goes up. Nothing else. It's not a revenue. It's not an expense. It doesn't impact the income statement. Number two, I receive $700 cash. So right away, I'm going to say $700 cash received. And it's received for services provided. So it's just the regular operating activity, $700 right here. Uh, services provided means a revenue. So a revenue goes on the income statement and the revenue increases my net income. And also, guys, net income is rolled into retained earnings, right? It's rolled into equity. So whatever you have in the column net income, income statement, you just copy to the column, uh, to the column total equity. There we go. A couple more. I pay 500 cash for wages. So I pay 500, cash goes down. Cash goes down in the statement of cash flows and paying for wages is an operating activity. Wages expense decreases my net income and that's copied, rolled into equity. 
And guys, the last one that I'm going to do, you will do the rest. I incur $100 legal costs on credit. So there is a bill sent to me from my lawyer and I'm not paying for it. I don't pay for it yet, but I owe the money, which means it's a liability. So there is, uh, I incur legal costs on credit. There is no asset, but that means I have a liability oops, of $100. Liabilities go up because it's on credit. It also means, but there's no cash, right? So I don't have to do anything with the statement of cash flows because there, it's not a cash transaction. It is an expense, however. It's a legal expense, so my net income goes down and that rolls into equity as a negative. So this is as much as I wanted to cover it. So have fun with the rest of the problem. And let me finish up this chapter with the description of this one ratio called uh, return on assets or return on investment. Because assets are considered to be our investment in the company, right? The company buys assets to generate profit. So in different chapters, we will cover different ratios, which are all summarized in chapter 13. All ratios are subdivided into these four groups, liquidity, solvency, profitability, market prospects. This ratio uh, is an example of a profitability ratio. We take net income and we divide it by average total assets. So it shows to me, well, how many cents Every dollar of assets gives me returns and profit. For every dollar of assets, how much profit does it make? Guys, the only problem here is that word average. So for average, you're going to take, you know, uh, your assets, total assets for the current year plus the last year, right? And then you're going to divide it by two. So let me use actually Google right here. I open Google, let me go to the balance sheet. So I have to you calculate, so whenever you see the word average, even though it's in denominator, calculate that average first, right? So right here, I have total assets of 232,000. Let me use, uh, let me use right here, calculator. So 232, guys, these amounts are actually in millions, right? So I have to add like six more zeros. So for Google, this is like their total assets is $233 billion. But when I do ratios, I don't have to worry about the zeros. They will be canceled out. So I take uh, 2018 total assets. I add 2019, 275. 909 and I divide it by 2. This is how we calculate the average, right? So my average is 254,351. I'll round up. It's in between. And then we need to take net income, which is on the statement of income right here. And guys, let's do 2019. So here is net income. Again, this is actually $34.3 billion, but we can drop zeros. 34,343 net income divided by total average, average total assets, 254,351. You're going to get a decimal. So you can see this decimal right here. So 0.135. So I like to think of it as a percentage or cents. So Google returns 13.5 cents for every dollar of assets, or 13.5%. And then, guys, is it good or is it bad? There are a couple of ways of thinking about it. You can calculate the same indicator for the previous year for Google, for Alphabet. And for this ratio, I want it to be higher. The higher, the better. So you can compare the company against itself. Compare it, you know, compare this factor, this ratio for the previous year, calculate for the previous year. Or you can do, you know, Google's uh, competitors and see, you know, how are Google's competitors are doing. And the company with the higher return on assets is more financially healthy, more attractive to investors. Or guys, there are also industry averages. 
which are published and you can have access to that information but usually you have to pay for it. So you can compare your company to the industry average. In general, here for this return on assets ratio, the higher uh, indicates, uh, the higher ratio indicates uh, better performance. That concludes chapter one. Thank you so much.